Greetings to everyone tuning in around the world. I'm Rebecca Blumenstein with the New York Times, and I'm very happy to be here with Mark Benioff, the CEO and chairman of Salesforce for the past 22 years, which is quite an impressive run. Uh, Mark, uh, Salesforce has played a key role in the pandemic. You've enabled remote uh, work and business, and you're also known as, in many ways, the original activist CEO, which has been a a big topic around the World Economic Forum these days. I'd love to start with that, especially, you know, over the past week, given the controversy here in the United States about Georgia and the restrictive voting rules that were passed. It's kind of reignited what the role of companies should be. What is your stand on that legislation? Well, my stand, Rebecca, is, uh, you know, that voting is the foundation of our democracy and everyone is entitled to their vote and we should encourage and have everyone legally voting um, as often as uh, possible in these elections so that uh, um, our democracy can continue. I think that's extremely important. And so uh, I, um, I, I'm in favor of the activism. I think it's important that these companies and these individuals realize that uh, they have a voice and that companies do have a role in uh, making a statement. I, and I'm all for what the uh, Major League Baseball did. They made a, a clear statement that they don't support it. They gave it a thumbs down. And of course, Salesforce gave it the same thumbs down before the vote happened. Have you been involved in trying to convince other CEOs to to take a more active stand, both in Georgia and in, in other on other issues? No, I think you know that I believe business is the greatest platform for change. I I believe that CEOs really have an opportunity using their businesses to improve society, and that could be directly uh, making a commentary to politicians or um, uh, building great products or making sure that their companies are net zero. I think in all of those cases, business are improving the state of the world. Do you think, I, I think in, at least in the U.S. business community, there was a, a hope and, and, and a Rich Lesser, who we both know, the CEO of Boston Consulting Group, was quoted in the Times this week saying that there, there have been some who, who thought that, you know, the hope this would become easier uh, after Trump. But in many ways, uh, workforces, uh, you know, people are getting more act, you know, activists, companies are being held to higher account and it's getting harder. How do you view this? I, I think a lot of people did think that post-Trump that the role of business would become clearer. Well, I look at it more about the employees. And when I look at our own company and when we've had to take certain activist roles like we've done in Indiana, for example, many years ago now, it's really driven by the employees. People always say to me, or like you mentioned, you know, our friend wrote a headline that Mark is the activist CEO. It's not me. It's really, I'm just acting on behalf of my employees. They make a case and, you know, I, I, we're one team. We're, I, I'm not making a, some unilateral decision. It's I'm trying to take their voice and their energy and channel it as, as they want me to. And I think employees today are really the true activists. So you, you can see that in your newsroom. You can see it in your industry. Um, you can see it in my industry, where the employees have a voice and a role and say, are able to say things and have action in ways that maybe previously they could not. And that's really where we are. And to that point, CEOs have a responsibility to listen to their employees and then act on their behalf. And I think in the case of Indiana, where there was laws being signed that constrained and started to discriminate against the LGBTQ community, you know, our employees said to me, hey, Mark, you have a responsibility to go out there and use now the power of the company that collectively we have and have it changed. And of course, we negotiated with the governor and we had that law changed. We found a mutual resolution. And you can see that in lots of places in the world, in the United States, but also in other countries, that companies can have a role in uh, shaping policy and expressing um, their uh, pleasure or displeasure with uh, certain policies. 
So are we getting closer to to what's known as stakeholder capitalism? I mean, and many many people have 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 you know criticized that term slightly, just just kind of considering it you know PR in a sense, and it's it's not really taken hold. Do you do you see this leading to to a meaningful change ultimately in in how capitalism works? Well, it came out of the World Economic Forum and the founder here, Klaus Schwab, who's currently the chairman of the World Economic Forum, really conceptualized and evangelized this idea that companies must be about all stakeholders and also their shareholders. So that means their employees are important, their customers, their partners, their local communities, their public schools, that the environment is a key stakeholder. You know, we can't have a successful business without a successful environment. And that CEOs, you know, can't just manage for shareholders. They have to have a bigger mindset. And that that idea of stakeholder capitalism, that you're, you know, you're really thinking about everything a lot more holistically, that is a winning idea. And it's not the idea that I had when I went to business school back in the 80s. You know, this is a relatively new idea. And it's an idea that has a lot more traction today than it's ever had. And when I talk to CEOs, they're able to operate for all stakeholders. And in some cases, they become exactly, as you said, theoretical activist CEOs, but really they're just saying, hey, on behalf of all of our stakeholders, we think that this company needs to take this action or this action or this action. In the case of MLB baseball, you saw this week, they basically said, we're moving the game because we don't think this supports all stakeholders. So this is a powerful motion in business and I encourage it. And I think that everyone has to be a part of improving the state of the world, including uh, companies, CEOs and their employees. So you think in a sense, all of these moves are part, part and parcel of a growing uh, stakeholder capitalism movement? Well, one of the most exciting things that happened this year, Rebecca, is the World Economic Forum's IBC, which is their International Business Committee, which is 200 of the top CEOs in the world, basically decided that they were going to begin to be fully transparent in what is, I would say, uh, 22 well-established metrics or KPIs, kind of key performance indicators in their companies that they have never published before. And of course, companies publish their revenue and profits and they're audited by these big four accounting firms. You know that, and you look at those reports, but those reports don't include things like emissions or pay equality or community investment and uh, a couple dozen other key KPIs. And these CEOs for the first time in business history have standardized on these 22 well-established metrics. And now uh, the four accounting firms have agreed to publish them and audit them. This is a big moment, but if you connect it back to what you were just talking about, what it means is that we're moving more towards stakeholder capitalism because these things are really stakeholder issues. They're not just pure financial metrics. They are about all stakeholders. And that is very exciting. And that's a new moment in business. So, so today, uh, Jeff Bezos made headlines uh, here in the United States when he called for an increase in the in the, the corporate income tax to support uh, President Biden's infrastructure plan. That's almost a classic, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, squaring off of the two interests here. Like traditional shareholder interests would would not would not uh, allow for a support of such a move. Um, do you, do you also support an increase in the corporate tax rate? Well, I think you saw several years ago, Salesforce um, advocated aggressively and helped get passed and even through the Supreme Court, a tax rate in San Francisco of a very small percentage of our revenue designed to support the homeless. Uh, the homelessness became a major issue in San Francisco. And so we advocated for Proposition C and that has passed, and now that generates about $30 million a month in additional services for the homeless in San Francisco. We felt it was starting to impede our ability to be successful, so we advocated for an additional tax. I think of the case where businesses believe, like you just said with Amazon and 
I think Salesforce also believes this as well, that it's appropriate to have increased taxes, that they should advocate for those taxes and they should make the case why that is. And I think in the case of the United States, we probably do need revisions and have conversations about what our tax rates should be, but we also have to balance that against the United States' ability and need to be competitive in the world. So whatever that final tax rate is, it needs to be set in a competitive framework. So are you are you agreeing with Bezos on this or saying that you think that, that you that you would support a general, you know, a general push to look at the this with fresh eyes? I'm, I'm in favor of looking at it with a beginner's mind and saying, let's look at the tax rates and let's, let's find the correct number and let's have a conversation and do it together. And uh, so mostly I would say I'm in favor of what Jeff is saying, but at the same time, I'm also saying, let's also do it in the framework of competitiveness and global competitiveness. So the environment is obviously uh, something that you're very uh, committed to as a leader and as a company. Uh, Salesforce uh, is is already net zero, and you've called on all other businesses to get to net zero. How realistic is that? I mean, it's a little easier for a cloud computing company than, say, General Motors or some heavily emitting industries. I think it's very realistic. I think that companies today... All companies have the ability to become net zero companies. I think all countries have the ability to be net zero countries. We just saw Prime Minister Suga, we're doing this under the auspices of Japan, calling and saying that he was going to accelerate Japan's push to become a net zero country. I'm very grateful to him for doing that. I think climate change and the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere is the number one issue in the world today. We need to do four things in regards to that. We need to reduce emissions. We need to sequester and get the 200 gigatons of carbon that we've put out into the environment since the first industrial revolution out of the environment. We need to educate people on how their behavior and their diets impact the amount of CO2 in the environment. And we need new innovations um, to uh, achieve all of that and to hit these major goals. Personally, I'd like to see a broad effort to um, sequester 100 or 200 gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere. It's one of the reasons why I founded two years ago at the World Economic Forum, 1T.org, which is the One Trillion Tree Initiative, the idea that we're gonna plant one trillion trees to sequester a couple hundred gigatons. Another reason why I'm so grateful that Canada just joined that effort and so they're going to plant 2 billion trees because we know that whether it's reforestation or um, other key things that we can do in the environment, we can make major impacts on the amount of CO2 uh, that we are currently uh, uh, moderating against. You uh, were successful in getting uh, President Trump to sign on to support this initiative, um, which many people felt uh, at the time would be impossible to do. Um, How important do you see your role as a CEO in terms of trying to make climate, uh, you know, uh, less of a partisan issue than it's become? Well, I think that climate is our number one issue. And I think when we look out at the next 20 years, Like we just heard from that fabulous video, we have all these amazing new technologies. How can we use it to improve the situation in the climate? And when we look at the climate, we see that, you know, there's uh, a need to um, change how we're interacting with the environment, that we have to reduce the amount of CO2 that we're putting out there. So we have to look at basically four types of carbons, if you will. There's green carbon trees, like I just mentioned, this idea of planting one trillion trees. We used to have six trillion trees on the planet. Now we have three trillion trees. Each trillion trees sequesters 200 gigatons of carbon. So as we reduced from six trillion trees to three trillion trees, we you know, basically released 600 gigatons of carbon. That carbon basically gets either absorbed into the soils, they absorb about 3,000 gigatons of carbon, or the oceans, and the oceans sequester about 20,000 gigatons 
of carbon. That's why the oceans are getting hotter because they're pulling more of that carbon uh, down. So we need to look at how are we gonna add more trees? How are we gonna nurture the soils or maybe move to regenerative soils or no-till farming to sequester more carbon? How we're going to create more environments in the ocean, whether it's through mangroves or seagrasses to sequester more um, CO2 in the, in the ocean successfully, or new kinds of gray carbon where we even have technology like uh, the technology being built, for example, in Switzerland by Climeworks to create gray carbon, be able to actually remove it from the atmosphere and turn it into blocks of uh, to be used for construction or buried in the ground. That that idea that there's four types of carbon, green, blue, brown, gray, that we need to put together a portfolio of that carbon, that's, you know, what I'm thinking about. And I've been inspired by a lot of companies who are using fourth industrial technology, like we just heard about, maybe things like artificial intelligence, where we can see that they are able to like um, have uh, clarity on where the biodiversity is on the planet and either how to conserve it or how to mitigate it or how to get corporations or, or even countries to say, okay, we're going to protect this because this is gonna be our carbon bank. This is really a, a moment where we have the ability to do all of those things. So ahead of the climate talks this fall, um, I, I uh, had the honor of interviewing Secretary Kerry soon after he started his role as, as the U.S. climate czar. You know, there was a broad consensus that business needs to do more. Aside from the WEF goals, would you support uh, businesses committing to new pledges to become net zero or, or, or to more aggressively tackle climate change? And many of them are now. Well, absolutely. And um, I think that the United States having a key administration official dedicated to the environment is an incredible first step. And that idea that businesses have to be part of the solution, I, of course, am going to fully agree with that. And I think that technology and next generation companies also have to be part of that um, solution. I've been very impressed, for example, with the work of a company called Sylvia Terra who's taken AI and biometricians to really be able to look at maps generated by companies like Planet Labs to say, here is where the carbon can be stored, or here is where biodiversity is that needs to be protected. And then for companies to come in and say, we're gonna pay for that conservation or for that growth or for that enhanced biodiversity, or for uh, companies like Heliogen, who are kind of building next generation solar systems that are, you know, um, architected and, and managed by graphical processing units to create green hydrogen, that there's these next generation capabilities that we can really harness to be able to deliver this, you know, climate solution that we're all looking for. I'd like to talk about the pandemic and how it's changed the world and, and the very nature of work. Um, uh, you know, Salesforce actually benefited to a certain extent by this sudden rush to, you know, to do so much work remotely. How much do you think work has changed um, for good? And, and you've announced some pretty aggressive plans yourself that, that um, you know, really a, a small fraction of your workforce is gonna be coming back to the office for five days a week. Well, for the last year, I've been working out of my home, and that's where I am right now. And um, I've been trying to mix, start to mix back in, going to the office, which I've done a number of times. And I've even started to do in-person customer events. I was just in Singapore, and I was able to meet with customers and also have an event and present to them like I would normally do in my business. And last week at Washington, D.C., I actually was able to go to Washington, D.C., and present to customers. It was outdoors. Unfortunately, it was raining, but we had to do it outdoors to be safe. And But I did. I was presenting to customers in the United States in a live event. For me, that was a milestone that we were kind of back, getting back gradually. And you mentioned uh, Secretary Kerry. I went and saw him at the State Department, and I walked through the State Department, but I realized when I was there, oh, most people are still working from home you know, that it's still very much a work from home environment. So that's actually a bit of a metaphor for me that we're all still very much at home. 
we're slowly, gradually coming back. Some people who are vaccinated can come back to work. People who are using testing environments aggressively can have events and can come back to work like I did last week. And we're going to have to find our way into a new normal. Now, does that mean that I'm going to get rid of my fancy camera and computer here that I have in my home and that I'm going to only work in the office? No, it doesn't. I'm going to continue to take the skills here that I've used, learned how to use in this environment and continue to use them in the future. And I will mix that with my physical environment, whether it's in-person events or in-person meetings in my offices around the world, that I'll bring it all together as one integrated working strategy, that I'll, that I'll do both. And I didn't have these skills before. I didn't even have this nice camera that I have plugged into my computer. And, you know, there's nobody here in the studio helping me. I'm all by myself doing this just like you are. And this is a skill that I have. I'm planning to use this called, you know, work from home skill. And that's also why Salesforce has entered into an agreement to buy Slack, because we believe that all of our products have to become work from home first. And so that will be a major strategic motion. We also built a product called Salesforce Anywhere so that our customers can be successful from anywhere and sell from anywhere, service from anywhere, market from anywhere, conduct commerce from anywhere, collaborate from anywhere. And so we're in a new world and uh, Salesforce is going to be a leader in that world. I want to pioneer these new models myself and I'm very excited about getting back into the new into the new world and out of the out of the pandemic. So my colleague Kevin Roos has written a book about the 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 push to automation, which many uh, uh, feel has accelerated. You know, we're, we've literally been in an environment where companies are rethinking human contact, um, uh, and and as we use AI more and and and, and really get this downstream uh, into into business. Um, do you worry about the the impact on workers who could be displaced as a result of this? Uh, some say that that basically years of work has been accelerated by the pandemic toward automation. Well, I think that we know that you know we have new types of software, new types of hardware, new types of robotic, and there's going to be you know growth in in automation and growth in you know, certain types of jobs that are going to be automated. At the same time, there's growth in new jobs and new capabilities. It's one of the reasons that Salesforce created a service called trailhead.com to help reskill millions of workers into new types of digital high value jobs, because we know that workers need to move from maybe what jobs were to what jobs need to be. And of course, that's constantly happening through history. Technology is moving forward. It's constantly getting lower costs. It's constantly getting easier to use. But workers need to be reskilled, and we can use technology to reskill workers and enter them into this new uh, world. So, as the U.S., for example, reopens and we see jobs come back and unemployment figures turn into employment figures, there's going to be some jobs that are not coming back. In those cases, those workers need to be reskilled and 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 really guided and helped into new positions, and that's a role that Salesforce wants to play uh, and be a very important part of. Also, during the pandemic, we've seen the tech companies, your company, and, and many of the other giants get even bigger and more powerful. You've come out pretty strongly in favor of, of more stringent uh, regulation of, of tech, especially the, the social media platforms. You famously compared uh, Facebook to, to uh, smoking uh, 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 the news to being the new cigarette. Um, what is your view of, of the best way to do this? And do you think it's going to happen quickly? Well, technology has moved so quickly. I don't think everyone realizes the power of artificial intelligence and the power of this information technology. Maybe they saw for the first time this year in social media, the impact of this technology or bots, so even on an election. Um, but it's happening every day in every facet of our life, whether we realize it's happening or not. And there's certain moments where the government needs to come in and revise and enhance regulations um, that no longer apply or used to apply and now no longer apply. And that's something that I've been advocating now for several years, exactly like you mentioned, that the government needs to become more active and more aggressive 
in their regulation of these companies and what is happening. And I think it's happened a little too slowly for my taste. And um, I think that society as in some parts of society specifically have been damaged because governments have not moved quickly enough. And there's been not enough regulation and new regulation written to kind of support the new world that we're in today. Do you think Facebook and Google uh, are doing enough to combat disinformation? They say they're trying, but, uh, you know, does it take, you know, them being subject to Article 230, some real changes in the law to make them actually legally liable? Well, I certainly called for that law to be looked at and enhanced or changed or for it for that whole section of the law to evolve. That's been important to me. I also believe that while those companies have made some changes and enhanced some of their policies, which I think is more than appropriate, I don't think that any of them have gone far enough. And I think there's plenty of examples where they just have not been aggressive. We're pulling those companies into the future. They should be pulling us and they should be not protecting their old revenue models, but instead they need to be aggressively going after how they're gonna protect us as their users, as society. That should be their primary uh, point of view. That's true stakeholder capitalism, not just focusing on your shareholder, but focusing on all of your stakeholders. And one of your key stakeholders is society and even your users and the structure you know, that you're existing in. So only focusing on your business model, which is I think how a lot of those companies have been behaving was completely inappropriate and they need to pivot to supporting all of their stakeholders and protecting us. And as an example, some of them now have products like you mentioned Facebook's just for children. And these technologies targeted and pointed towards children, well, that's where I think things have to cross the line and you say that has to stop and that's why I'm such a supporter of the work and policies that have been advocated by Common Sense Media, because they have uh, really said, hey, when you're going after children, you, you need to protect them and not turn them into your product. But that is what is happening at Facebook. So our time is quickly passing. I have two last uh, quick questions, probably. But um, uh your own future, uh, Jeff Bezos has given up the CEO title. Uh, some have said that uh, you have a worthy successor uh, uh, in Brett Taylor. Do you have any plans to make a change to your own uh, status anytime soon? Well, I mean, Rebecca, I, every year that I've been the CEO of Salesforce, I get that question. You know, that's a common interview question for a CEO. And all I can tell you is I'm, I'm uh, here and uh, uh, very excited. I've never been more excited about the future of Salesforce. It's been an amazing 22 years of Salesforce. And I think the next 22 years for Salesforce will be even more amazing. Finally, you brought uh, Time Magazine. I thought you were going to say that, but uh, <laughs> uh, you bought Time Magazine, which is in the process of issuing NFTs you've be and, and doing some business in Bitcoin, you've become a, a, you know, a believer in those technologies, I assume. Well, I think you have to look at Bitcoin and NFTs and cryptocurrencies as an exciting part of the future. It's really incredible technology. At Salesforce, we've been using them for years. We've built those blockchain technologies deeply into our platform. We've helped Customers provide everything from transparent food uh, networks so that consumers can see how exactly how their food was delivered to uh, helping sneaker companies automate their supply chains and making sure that they're net zero, all using the blockchain. You know, now I think when you look at the next generation of blockchain killer apps, of course, Bitcoin is a killer app for the blockchain. Another killer app for the blockchain is NFT. Well, for media companies, it's an exciting uh, monetization capability for their digital assets. And for Time Magazine, you can see how they have now been able to turn quite a few of their covers into NFTs. And I'm confident that there'll be a number of other amazing cover opportunities coming for uh, collectors of Time Magazine uh, in the future. And it's exciting to work with those collectors to offer them products uh, like the NFT versions of Salesforce, uh, Salesforce time covers so that they can uh, add those to their collections. Maybe we should add to some Salesforce covers in there too. 
Mark, thank you so much for a fascinating Some New York Times covers too, Rebecca. Some New York oh, thank Times. you. We appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Take care.